Well, good evening. Hello, everyone. How you doing? I'm Lee Love, and this is uh, Photo Mentor TV, Friday night edition, which we do here every Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, and I'm glad you could join us. If you are watching uh, live, terrific. Hey, great to have you here. Be sure and uh, leave your questions and comments in the uh, Facebook or YouTube um, comment section. And if you're watching on a replay, hey, glad to have you here anyway. Uh, tonight's kind of an interesting uh, night. This is the um, really the end of the July, of course, and uh, this celebrates our one-year anniversary of doing this show. Um, we started in July of last year, of course, and uh, pretty amazing that it's been going this long. I never uh, never expected it to um, when I started, of course. But uh, you know that's the way things go. One day at a time, one uh, one foot in front of the other. And uh, look what happens. So anyway, it's all because of you guys. I really appreciate all your help, all your questions. Uh, I know that sounds kind of strange. Like, wait a minute, he's, we're asking him questions, he's thanking us. But what you don't seem to understand is that your questions motivate me. Your questions inspire me and make me want to do better and to be able to answer your questions and give you good, accurate, solid information. And uh, so that's that's why it's important to me. Anyway, so um, the tonight show is going to be a little bit different. I don't know. Maybe they're all different. Uh, um, we don't have anything particularly um, on this the last uh, Friday of the month. But um, I am going to do something that I where I'm going to talk about ten photographers that I think you should know about, and ten photographers that had had an influence on my work. I uh, posted a. Uh, a message in the Facebook group that we have, um, the Photo Mentor TV Facebook group, asking for people to post the uh, photographers that have influenced them. And last time I checked, no one replied. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. And so what I thought possibly was that maybe you guys haven't been exposed to any photographers that have inspired you, or maybe you just haven't done the research or whatever and haven't been shooting long enough to do that. And so I thought maybe I'd share some of the 10 that I um, that have influenced me, and maybe that would inspire you guys or motivate you guys to look into um, somebody that would do the same for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so anyway, so that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, before we do that, I want to remind you guys that, again, that this is um, the first um, Friday of the month is next next week, of course. And we do photo reviews every month, uh, the first Friday of the month. And i uh, love to have you submit your work. We can give you some uh, comments on that. And, uh, again, these are, um, these are more professional feedback. Mm, excuse me, <clears throat> and I have a drink or something here. I'm losing my frog in my throat. Um, it's not whether I like it or not. It's really whether the image works or not. And I look at it as, uh, artistically and technically and uh, give you some input on that. And I'll look at it from a uh, how well it communicates the message I think you're trying to get across. But anybody, is, you're welcome to... Um, Anybody can uh, submit their work. Doesn't matter how long you've been shooting. Doesn't matter what kind of camera, iPhone, whatever. Feel free to submit your images. Just go to review.photomentor.tv and uh, fill out that form and submit them. And we'd love to have you um, have you submit some work. We've already gotten some already for this month, which is great. Um, and again, if you're a social media person. Um, we are on Facebook, of course, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Twitter. So if you want to follow us there, be glad to uh, follow you back. And if you are interested in joining the Facebook group, we'd love to have you over there. It's a small group, but it's um, it's on purpose, something I can put pres um, personal attention into and in answering your your questions. And uh, you can do that by going to photomentortv slash join and uh, there'll be some instructions there on how you do that. So, anyway, um, before we get started tonight, I'm going to share a little something for you. I was trying to decide whether I should do this or not. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, 
One of the things I've never told anybody this. No, nobody on this on the channel, of course. I don't know that I've even told that many people that work with me. But um, the reason for Photo Mentor TV and also Photo Mentor Academy, which I'm going to talk about, was something that happened to me back in 2019. Around October 2019, I was getting restless, and I was like, you know, I really need to do something different. I, I really want to change the work that I'm doing. And, um, you know, I've been teaching for about 10 years and, of course, working as a commercial photographer. So I love teaching. And I tried to figure out, I tried to analyze what was it I really love to do. And other than creating, I really enjoy inspiring and working with other photographers. And I, I do that a lot. I get hired a lot to do Lightroom training or Photoshop training or lighting is my my expertise, my my passion, or basic photography. So I said, you know, I really, it's something I think I want to do. Well, about a month later, I, I ran, a friend of mine called me and said, um, his name is Dr. Joe, and he was a client, but he became a really good friend. And he said, Lee, um, I... Um, I've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and I've got about six months to live. And I was devastated, of course. Um, the man was well off. He had sold, he had five practices. He sold them just about a couple years earlier, and he was going to retire, him and his wife. And about six months, I went by his house, saw him, and spent some time with him, and about six months later, he was gone. Um, and it really hit me hard because it made me realize there's got to be more to life than what I'm doing. And that's when I decided to start looking into doing more, reach more people. I mean, I was doing training, but I wanted to reach more people. So I started doing some YouTube work. And, you know, I've had some video background. I won't go into the detail. I've worked for many networks. And so the, tele the video part wasn't difficult. But I wasn't sure what it was I wanted to say or who I wanted to reach. And um, so I started, I made some changes in my career and cut back on some things I had been doing. And um, about, um, so about six months later, about right around, I think, February, I think I made a change and I cut back. And I sort of spent a lot of time on Facebook and things like that, looking at what people were doing and what kind of information they needed. And I quickly realized that there's not a lot of good information out there, a lot of bad information out there. There's a lot of information but it's good or bad. And what I looked at, the way I judge that is how does it compare to what I know in the real world? As someone that's been a commercial photographer for over 25 years, um, you know, you learn a lot, a few things. And um, it's like, well, you can, there's book knowledge and then there's practical knowledge. And what I realized very quickly was there was not a lot of good information. And I would go into these beginner Facebook groups and hang out there and try and answer questions. And I was really dumbstruck by how bad the information was, the myths and the bad information and just mi and just misinformation and or not any information at all. People would be berated. And I said, you know, this has got to be better than this. So that's when I started doing um, really about this time is when I launched, not too long after that, I launched the video, uh, a, a YouTube channel, which didn't really, didn't it was too much work. I didn't really want to, didn't keep up with it. And um, so I decided to start doing live streaming, and um, that was back in around February, I think, of 2020. And this was before COVID, actually. I had been planning this before the COVID had hit, and um, but when I got everything all together, it kind of around March and April, then this started happening. I was in perfect position to start doing online training. It really was. I just flipped the switch. I was already there. So that's when in July I started Photo Mentor TV and started doing this on a weekly basis. Well, after a year I've worked, I've met so many of you. You guys are fantastic. I love you guys. You've just been terrific. I've worked with so many of you. I can go on and on and on how many, uh, whether it's Claudia in Romania or, um, you know, uh, Annette up in Connecticut or um, I spent... Um, three hours on the phone on a Zoom call with somebody a couple of weeks ago in New Zealand, uh, helping them with the Lightroom uh, issue they were having. Anyway, the point is I've met a lot of great people, and you guys have been really good, become good friends. 
And so I know that you know you've told me over and over again that you want more. There's you need more. I mean, I can tell that this is not enough. The Facebook group is great, and um, this is you know doing this week every week is nice. But there's got to be more to it because I see and and so many of you come back and said, Lee, this is just amazing. You've helped me so much. My work has improved. And just just by via the way I've been doing training, but I want to take it up and and, and amp it up and go further. So um, I came up with the idea of launching Photo Mentor Academy, and Photo Mentor Academy is a way to really take what I'm doing here and go ten times more, um, more one on one, more information, go deeper. More demos, more hands-on kind of stuff to show you guys uh, how this stuff all works and how to improve. Also, I know you guys have a lot of questions about marketing and business, and that's something else that I wanted to work with you on. So um, we're going to be starting to launch. I was um, so let me just kind of keep going here. So I've been working on this about a year, an idea that I want to do, and understanding what the the process was and how to host it, and I mean that kind of thing. And um, was going to launch it a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> and for, you may or may not know, but about two weeks ago on July, two weeks, three weeks ago, July 4th, July 5th, I found out my friend, frankly, Ruggles, who's a professional landscape photographer, passed away in his sleep. And that just really, really hit me hard. Again, it was a reminder, though, Lee, don't wait. Don't spend all your time waiting to do something. Just do it. And um, so I, it put me back a little bit because I was really about ready to launch Photo Mentor Academy, the, the, the uh, initial beta. But that put me back a couple of weeks. So, um, But I'm, gonna, I'm, more, I'm working on it again now. We're going to do this in the next couple of days. So here's what's going to happen. Let me just kind of tell you. So um, we're gonna, the, all of you, the people that I've been working with over the last year, are going to get first crack at this. You're going to get a personal email from me and probably a video explaining what this is all about. And you're going to get the first introduction. And it's what I call the founding members. The founding members are going to get this, um, everything I have, all this one-on-one. All, I mean, it's about $6,000 worth of training, to be honest with you. Um, and um, everything I launch, you will get access to because I need your help. I need you to tell me what order to do. I know the information. It's not a problem, not a question of tell me what you need to know. It's a question of which, how do I structure it and how do you want to digest the information? So, but I need your help in doing that. And so I'm going to limit this to just a handful of people, a couple dozen people at the most. Um, and then once we do that um, and the, get the skeleton in place, then about 30 days later or less, I will launch this publicly, and those the rest of you that are interested in joining in that particular time will be open to do so. Um, I think you're going to like what I'm doing. I think you're going to be. It's different. It's not like anything else in anybody else's teaching. Um, it's it's because number one, and a lot of people are like, oh, you can just do the same thing on YouTube. You can't do the same thing on YouTube, and the reason is because there's a process, and I've developed this over the last ten years. This process, so I call C tell exposed process or steps, and it's different than what other, everybody's trying to teach you how to shoot on manual. You got to shoot on manual. Got to shoot on manual. My process is not the same way. My process is to focus more on learning to see first, learning to tell story second, then learn the camera settings, and then learn post processing and how to bring all this together. So uh, this is something I've really been working on, like I said, for 10 years, and it works. I've used it for, you know, k kids, and I've taught grandmothers the same process. And the reason it works is because it allows you to become more creative and a better photographer and gain more confidence faster. That's the key. It's not that you can't learn it by doing other methods, but it's by, by focusing on the technical first you were you really stunt, you're stunting your growth because now you're worrying about technical stuff instead of the artistic. People do not buy technology. People do not buy cameras. Do not buy sensors. Do not buy lenses. They buy emotion and they buy storytelling, and that's what you need to learn first. So anyway, I don't want to go into too much now, but the point is, I wanted to tell you what was going on and why I decided to do this and what what precipitated this, 
and over a year ago is something I decided I wanted to do and why I'm doing it now. So anyway, for those of you that I've been working with, again, I'll be reaching out to you directly and uh, and giving you an invitation and telling you what's going on and giving you more details. And then from there, we'll go public sometime after that. So anyway, Photo Mentor Academy, if you're interested in checking it out, there's a little bit on there um, now. Um, and um, see what's going on, you know. Anyway, enough of that. So thanks very much for letting me uh, talk a little bit about that. I wanted to share with you my story and a little bit why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I put so much time and effort into helping you guys, because it's important to me. And uh, you guys inspire me and motivate me. And um, it's why I don't talk a lot about my work or my photography. And it's not because I don't want to show it off. It's because it's not about me. It's about you. It's all about you. And that's what where my focus is. So anyway, okay, enough of that. Sorry about the uh, waxing on about that stuff. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about um, 10 photographers that um, I think you should know about. And I'll give you a little bit of background on them and kind of a little, some, a little bit how they influenced me. And maybe um, you should have your own list, by the way. Maybe some of these people will apply, appeal to you. Maybe they won't. But uh, there's so many great photographers out there. That's that's the hard part. It depends on the genre of work that you're trying to do. Uh, if you go and search on top 10 photographers in the world or whatever, a lot are, are top 10 photographs that were ever made. Uh, a lot of them are photojournalism work, which is great, but not everybody does that kind of work. Um, for me, I really I was a photojournalist. I do some of that. I had a, I still do some magazine assignments from time to time. In fact, I had one last week. Um, but for me, I like commercial photography. I like creating images. Making images is really what it's all about. Um, and um, so, from so to find the photographers that I was looking for were not the typical kind of photojournalist photographers that I follow. So let me let's kind of go into a couple of these and I'll see how this works. So the first photographer I want to talk about tonight is, of course, it's not going to be any surprise who this is going to be, I don't think. And that's going to be Ansel Adams. Now, Ansel Adams, everybody knows a lot. If you're a photographer, you should know Ansel Adams. I mean, come on. He's like the, the most well-known landscape photographer that ever was. Now, I don't shoot landscapes. But what really was inspiring to me about Ansel Adams and where I, I started following him early on in my career was he had developed something called the zone system. And the zone system was a way to look at a scene and um, determine the exposure. So you could look at something and he had it was a, it was like a, a chart had 10 steps on it. One was pure black. One was pure white, and there was a gradation in between. And his method was you look at the brightest point. Let's say you look at a, at a cloud. That's a 10, meaning no detail in it. You look at the, the, the darkest point in the scene with no detail, and you average that out, and that gives you an idea of where you want that scene to fall. In other words, what you would do is you'd say, well, even without having a light meter, you could ideally you could have an, a, a spot meter, and you could look at those. you say, okay, do I want detail or I don't want detail in the darks or in the in the whites? And then you would know where to adjust your, your settings on your camera to get the best exposure. So he was really influential in that regard, not just because of his landscape work, but also because of the impact he had on um, photography in general. So let's see here. Let me pull this up. I want to show you a couple of his images. Of course, you guys will probably already know who they are, like I said before. Um, where are they? Let's see if I have them. Which one? Okay. So this one here is, um, sun, this is, um, Moonrise Hernandez in New Mexico. This is probably his most famous picture. Um, it's an interesting image because if you look, if you get, read behind this, the story behind this image, he didn't have his light meter. So he had to guess. And he looked at what the moon was, and he kind of knew what the exposure of the, of the moon was. And he knew what the exposure of the, of the buildings were, again, looking at using the zone system in his head. And he calculated, he got one frame on a 4x5 a or an 8x10 camera. I don't know which one, but a, a sheet film camera. One frame, that's all he got, and this is it. 
Um, but he, the the interesting thing about it is if you read about the history behind this image, he has printed it multiple times in different ways. He, it was a very thin ne- negative, and so it wasn't really properly exposed. It was a little too dark. Um, and so he um, he's printed it, and there's a book out that he shows him over the years how he's printed this photo. The point I'm trying to make is that people look at they th- they look at post processing as a way to fix things, and that you can do some of that. But it's really more about helping to convey the message and the story that you want to tell behind the photo. He's continued. Ansel Adams continued to tweak and process this this photo differently each time over the years to try and bring out what it was he was trying to say or to get across in his image. And that's the difference. So one of his quotes is my favorite. He's got a lot of them. I use them all the time if you watch the show at all. There are always two people in every picture, the photographer and the viewer, meaning, and you're going to see this theme run out, run throughout all these other photographers as well that I'm going to mention, that a photo is as much about you as it is the person you're photographing. Your background, your unique, your history, your way of the scene, your way of viewing, that's what makes the image. I mean, it's what you bring to the table, not the camera, not anything else. So, um, anyway, that's, it's pretty interesting to look at it that way, as opposed to just looking at, you know, the, the technology and the cameras and things like that. So, okay. So he's, uh, he's got another photo here. Um, so, this is another one of his, of course. And again, there's a whole bunch of them. I encourage you to look it up. Yeah, if you know who he is, I'm sure you do. If you don't, um, he's somebody you should... If you have any interest in landscape photography, he's definitely somebody you should um, be aware of. Okay. Um, the next person we're going to talk about is Pete um, Turner. Now, I doubt many of you people have heard of Pete Turner. He was somebody that influenced me early on in my career... And he, um, Pete was, um, you know, born in 1934. And so he was a photojournalist and also a commercial photographer. But one thing that Pete did that was unusual is he was right there on the cusp of when color film came on into being. And it was, you know, not a lot of people trusted color film. It was hard to work with. The latitude, you know, that wasn't that great wasn't like black and white. You didn't have 10 stops of dynamic range, that kind of stuff. Um, and so he, but he had a really interesting um, way of looking at photos. And his work was really, it had very, very vibrant color. And that's what drew me to it. And it ha- I, I know now today that that's some of the reason that my images, I like have a nice punchy color. To them, and I think it's probably because of the influence I saw in Pete Turner's work. It's interesting because I found his work originally um, on an album on, for album covers. Jazz, he was shot a lot of album. Um, his work was used a lot for album covers, um, jazz primarily. Um, as uh, Blue Note Records, I don't think, and there was another one. I can't think of the name of it now. Maybe it wasn't Blue Note, but anyway. Um, and his, this is one that I think was on an album cover. And this one was definitely one that was on an album cover. Um, of course, his use of light is fantastic. Um, and this one here is just a, a you know a manhole cover in New York within the snow. But his work with color was just fantastic, and it really had a big influence on me and the kind of work that I you know the, how I started taking into color and how color could be used to help tell the story. And, of course, his quote is, uh, a photographer's work is... So this is something that you'll hear me talk a lot about in a different way and a different theme. And that's what I was trying to say before. We're all unique. We're all... I, we, we, we bring something different to, to, the, to each photograph. Where you stand, the lens you select, the settings of the camera you set, how you frame the image. All of that is different. To, both of us could go out together, same camera, same co- equipment side by side, and your images will look different than my images. So that's important. That's why I keep, bring, that's why I keep harping on it. I keep bringing it. You want to bring, you want to develop that. You want to bring that forward. 
You want to work on that. You want more of that. So it's this is part of why I'm trying to teach you guys this and sh talk about these these photographers because I want you to kind of understand or answer the question, why do you want to be a photographer? And what kind of photographer do you want to be? Now, you may not know that right now. It's fine. It takes a while. It's not something to just you go, oh, I'm going to be this kind of photographer. I mean, you know, it, it, you gotta you got to shoot for a while before you figure that out. But the point is... The, the images are, are come from in here, okay? Not here. And so that's ideally what the goal of every photographer, great photographer wants to be, is you want to get hired for your vision, for what you see, for your storytelling capability, not because of your equipment. Nobody hires somebody because you have a great camera. Now, maybe right now that may be why you're being hired or maybe by cut price or whatever, but that's not where you want to be. You want to move past that. And you want to get to the point where people say, oh, I love what you did with so-and-so. Oh, the pictures you did of Jill were amazing. They just, they so much, that is so her. I want you to do that for me. That's where you want to get to. Now, it's not easy to do, okay? You could take some work. But that's ideally where you want to go, okay? All right. So the next photographer I want to, um, so um, he, like I said, Pete did a lot of album covers, and one other quote I want to read to you says, What have I done wrong? He said later, Nothing, I think. I'm steadily surprised that there are so many photographers that reject manipulating reality as if it was wrong. Change reality. If you don't find it, invent it. So, you know, he looked at, at photography as art. And if he, it wasn't, you're not a photocopier. The image doesn't have to look exactly like what it did in front of you when you, t you it's your interpretation everything you do is your interpretation your lens your camera your settings all those are your interpretation of what that scene should look like so what he's trying to tell you here is embrace that don't ignore it okay all right so the next one is um um richard avedon i don't know if you've heard of him or not richard avedon was a um, fashion photographer pr primarily. I believe he started out as a a photo uh, journalist, but then he quickly moved into. I, actually, I take that back. He started as a working as an advertising photographer for a department store, and um, some of the people at Harper's Bazaar and other people saw his work and were just mesmerized by it. So he became shooting for the became shooting started shooting for them. And became a lead photographer for Vogue, um, and things like. And he shot for so many fashion people, Versace and Calvin Klein, and things like that. I'm going to show you some pictures of Brooke Shields. Maybe you'll you remember those pictures, or you've seen those somewhere. Um, but he's photographed, you know, uh, Andy Warhol, um, Marilyn Monroe, Billy Graham. I mean. Eisenhower, George Wallace, the Beatles, everybody. He's, he's just everybody. But his, his, the thing, the reason I, now I don't shoot fashion, okay? I don't have any interest in shooting fashion. But what I love about his work is his eye, how he sees the world. That's what drew me to his, his work, okay? So if you look at, here's, the, here's a shot of, um, that, of um, Brooke Shields that he did for Calvin Klein jeans which is a little bit provocative at the time, um, but it kind of put her on the map and also him on the map in many ways. And he's actually done a lot, I think some some videos, if I'm not mistaken, um, as well. But anyway, um, so his work is really kind of unique. And there's a couple others I'll show you. Like there's one of Liz Taylor, if you know who she is. But one of my favorite ones are these next two here. And this is one... He did with an, so this uh, model and these elephants. Here, I'll show you another picture. So I just look at this and I'm like, oh my gosh, how did it, what an amazing setup. And how, so I think for me, one of the things I love about this photo is the juxtaposition. A lot of my images are like this as well. I'll take two things that don't go together and I love to put them together. So here, a, 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 a model dressed up to the nines in this, this evening dress with these elephants. I mean, it's total juxtaposition. So, um, anyway, I just, the concept alone, I think, is fantastic to come up with that. And uh, here he is um, laying out uh, displays. So, anyway, um, very interesting guy. 
Um, his quote is he he's one he said start with a style, and you're in in chains. Start with an idea, and you are free. What he's trying to say is, you don't if you go in thinking, oh, I I shoot this type of style, my my work looks this way. I use this kind of filter, this kind of preset. You're already behind. You're already losing. You can't do that. You have to you have to go into a situation with an idea, with a concept. With a story is what I'm trying to tell you guys. If you haven't figured this out, I'm repeating it over and over again with a story. So when I go into a photo shoot, here's what I do. So it depends on the project, of course. But I always have at least two to three ideas of how I'm going to shoot this project. Um, now, the client may give me an idea say, hey, here's what we're looking for. And that's fine. And I'm going to shoot that. But I also want to have my own ideas in case that doesn't work. Um, I look at it like this. I'm going to shoot the client work. And then I'm going to shoot my work, right? If there's time permitting and it works within the budget, then I'm going to shoot some stuff just for me. Even if I didn't get paid, I want some images out of this that are something that I am proud of, that I that I art directed and it's something I came up with. Um, if you're not doing that, then the next thing you should be doing is personal projects. Every photographer should have at least two or three personal projects in the works, Okay. So something you want to do, something that you came up with, a concept, a friend, whatever. You got this idea. Don't copy somebody else. Come up with your own idea. And so, you know, I'd love to see how if this will work. It may work. It may not work. But you have to try it. That's how you grow. That's how you get better. That's how you become more creative. I could tell you so many stories of art directors when I showed them my book, my, my portfolio, and they'll thumbing through it, and they'll see some stuff from Audi or whoever, some big name. And then they'll stop on the one picture and they'll say, tell me about this one. Every single time, that picture is a personal project. They can tell. And they'll say, well, what well tell me what happened. What was it behind this? And then I'll go into it. That's what they're looking for. They're looking to find out how I would approach a project. They want to hire me to say, if I gave this to you, how would you shoot this project? They're looking... That's what they get a bunch of people to they can get anybody to shoot, shoot it to a storyboard the way they want to do it. They're trying to get some creative input to make their work and their client work better. Anyway, so that's that's why that is so important. Okay, the um other um person that you may not uh, have heard of, I don't know, in, uh, is uh, a woman. Her name is Margaret Bork White, and she had a big influence on me. I loved her work. I followed her um, for years and years and years, and um, she was a photographer both for Life magazine and also, I believe, for Magnum, which was became a an agency. And um, she was a war photographer. She photographed uh, in the Midwest during um, the Depression, she, and I'll show you some of her images. But... You know, one thing, I, I don't know, it never appeared, never occurred to me really one way or the other that she was a woman or not. It didn't matter. I just loved her work. But she said, it seems to me um, that while it's very important to get striking picture of a light, of a line of smokestacks, which I'm going to show you in a minute, or a row of dynamos, it's becoming more and more important to reflect that life that goes on behind the photographs. In other words, it's story. She's trying to say, okay... And I think one of the reasons I liked her work is she did a lot of industrial work. Um, and I'll, you'll see in a minute here what I'm talking about. But um, I love that stuff, mechanical things, industry, behind the scenes, how things work. But what's interesting about her is that this, is, this was a woman that was in the 1900s. And she didn't let anything stop her. She was, she was just doing everything that everybody else did. So, you know, when you think that because you're a woman or because whatever, you have a disability, whatever it may be, you think that's a disadvantage. It, it's not. It's only, the only disadvantage is you. The only disad, there's only disadvantages right here between your ears, okay? It's only you that will hold yourself back, nobody else. So don't, don't let that decide, you know, to hold, just say, oh, well, I can't do this because I don't have this camera. I don't have this equipment or I don't have the experience. Doesn't matter. Get experience. Shoot it anyway. Shoot with the equipment you have. You're never going to have all the right equipment. And I think Margaret Bork White is a good example of someone that didn't hold back and didn't let the the, the times or the situation um, control her. 
So um, this is a pic- this is a picture of Gandhi in India that she photographed right before he was killed. Right after this, apparently, um, and this was like one of the most. This was made the cover of Life magazine, of course. Um, this is the dynamo she's talking about, you know, and she's saying, hey, what's the story behind this? It's not just about dynamos. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of other things going on here, you know. What's the sto- well, who the, you know, and I don't know why there are not any people in there. Uh, to me, I'd like to have seen some people working and that's the kind of stuff I would have shot. But it's very artistic, very um, graphical, and I just loved her work. So it's just something that influenced me. This is some of her work here. Again, these are the, on the left and the upper left is the smoke, the stacks that she's talking about, having a story behind that. And um, so, and this is this is one of my favorite pictures of her. Check this out. Talk about ballsy. <laughs> oh my gosh, not not this not this boy. Um, and, and also, look at the camera, okay? No no 14 frames a second, no, you know, auto light meter, none of that stuff. One frame of video, one frame of at a time. Looks like a speed graphics or something like that. So, you know, you can do it. I know you guys can do it. I've just got to put your mind to it. This is, again, the light cover of Life magazine I was talking about. This is also during the Depression, some stuff that she had photographed. So don't let anything hold you guys back, you know. Don't don't think you can't do it because I know you can do it. If if she can do it in the 1900s, you can do it now. Just look how I mean, I keep telling people, they have no idea how easy it is now. No idea, you know. And complain this camera doesn't have that or eye focusing or this and that. you got to be kidding me, really? Come on. These cameras are amazing at what they do and especially for the money. There's nothing you can't shoot with any camera out today. So, anyway, I don't mean to get off on that, but just trying to get you guys to be better. I want you to improve. I don't want you to give, complain. So, all right. All right, let's see. So, the next one is um, someone who I really, really like his work. Um, and this is um, Yusef Karsh. By the way, I saw your hello. Thank you very much um, for joining us. Um, his work is fantastic. He, he had a big influence on me, and um, he is he he. If you notice, there's a theme here. He's saying, L- "Look and think before opening the shutter." The heart and mind are the true lens of the camera. In other words, it's all about emotion. It's, I keep telling you guys, it's about the emotion. That's why when I was talking about the the method that I teach, is not teaching the mechanics. It's teaching the scene and the telling first. That's what makes people connect to an image, not the technology. They don't care about the ISO. They don't care about the noise. They don't care about the bokeh. They don't care about any of that. They care, does it make them look amazing, and does it tell a story? So anyway, so his work is uh, fantastic as well, and um, his stuff is a little more in the portraiture range. Uh, This is um, Albert Einstein, okay? But his lighting is just phenomenal. I mean, you know, I just, you guys know I love lighting anyway. And this is my kind of lighting here. This is the stuff I would love to shoot if I'm shooting for myself. Um, This is, um, gosh, I've got to remember his name now. Author. I know you guys, uh, Hemingway. Um, Just really amazing image there. Great texture. Um, And, you know, not looking into the camera. Looking outside the camera, but he's still connecting with it. Just a, a phenomenal look. Same thing here with uh, Martin Luther King. Just, an, uh, just I don't know, just a fantastic um, um, a portrait, I think, uh, of, of someone. And then this guy right here, this is Pablo. Um, um, what am I trying to say? Gone blank here. Sorry, guys. Um, not Palm. Yeah. Um, Picasso. Gosh. <laughs> um, there's an interesting story about this. He says that, uh, he showed up at the gallery where he was going to photograph him 
And uh, the guy that runs the gallery said, ah, he's not going to show up. He never does. And um, Karsh loaded all his gear in, set it all up. And lo and behold, Picasso showed up right on time, all dressed up with a nice clean shirt and everything. And the, the, the uh, gallery owner was blown away. He's like, wow. So, um, so anyway, and one last photo, I believe, is this one right here. And this is probably his most famous one. This is the one that put him on the map, Winston Churchill. And the story behind this one I've told before, and if you have heard it, but Churchill didn't know he was going to be photographed. So he had, Churchill had just given a speech up in Canada, and um, he was and uh, Karsh was set up to photograph him. And he he came in and he said, "What's going on?" And he said, "I'm here to take your photograph, sir." And he goes, well, "Nobody told me." Blah blah blah. And he set up across the room, and he said, you know, can you come over here and stand over here? And he was all grumpy. He went over there, and he stood there, and he's puffing on a cigar. And Karsh reaches over, asking him, he says, Sir, um, Mr. Prime Minister, can you remove the cigar? And he said, no. Karsh reaches over, grabs a cigar, pulls it out of his mouth or out of his hand, snaps his picture. Perfect. Just amazing. He has the look. And, just ama- and then the next picture... He hands the cigar back to the guy and apparent to, to Churchill, and apparently the next picture is just him laughing, and he really loved that. Churchill just loved that he had done that, and so, but that's what it took, and it's just a fan. It's just an amazing image. There's just no way about it. Um, the pose, the look, everything. It's so Churchill, right? It definitely is the way we've all known and read about. So anyway, so. That's um, so. Um, Yusef Karsh is one of the. Uh, he they had a um, an exhibit not too long ago down in um, D.C. here, and uh, I got a chance to go see some of his original work. It's pretty pretty impressive. Okay, um, the next person I want to uh, um, talk about. Let's see if we have any questions. First of all, not right now. Okay. All right, so um, the next um, another gentleman, sort of in the same kind of, not genre, but the same light, lighting style, and his name is George Harrell. I don't know if you've heard him, but his work is also a big influence. I just love his, his work. And George Harrell was a photographer that um, was started off as a painter, actually, in uh, Chicago, and he moved to um, California because they were told that's where, you know, you need to be, and he he met some people out there, and they basically convinced him to photograph, to take up photography because he was was already a photographer, but he used photography to shoot pictures that he would then paint. And um, anyway, I'll show you some of his work. It's it's phenomenal. But uh, I love his quote. It says, it's so simple. No one believes me. You strike a pose, then you light it, then you clown around, get some action and expressions, and then you shoot. (laughs) So, you know, obviously somebody that just loved what he did and um, didn't look at it too too, um, closely or analytically. He just, when he saw something, he shot, he photographed it. When he didn't, he didn't. But uh, anyway, so his work um, is very glamour-oriented for Hollywood. And his the lighting is just phenomenal when you look at his his stuff. Very dramatic. Um, Gary Cooper. Um, again, a lot of people are afraid of shadow, but shadow is what gives a, a picture an image depth. I've said this many times. We're photographing a two dimension or three dimensional world in a, with a two dimensional um, medium. So you have to give it depth, and that's you do that through focus, you do that through lens, through shadow, through lighting. You guys, recognize this guy? Huh? Maybe it may the force be with you. This was a, a long time. This was, I think, nineteen seventy something. Um, so this guy is a youngster at this point. I bet he was probably eighteen or twenty at the most. Maybe not even that old. But uh, what a great thing to have a portrait from George Harrell. Um, at that age, Humphrey Bogart, 
So um, George Harrell was an amazing photographer and somebody that really, if you want to study noir and you want to study lighting, um, definitely look up his work. Um, and I apologize. Actually, I forgot. Somewhere here I have his. I, I went through and I found the URLs, as many as I could at least, for um, for some of these people. So here I'll just show you. So Pete Turner is PeteTurner.com. Okay. R Richard Avedon, if you want to look his work, is Avedon.Foundation.org. Um, and I'll, I'll post these if you want. And Margaret Borkwart, I could not find a URL for her. Um, there's some uh, MoMA and some other museums and things like that had some of her work. And Life Magazine had some of her work. But I didn't see that she had a website of her own. Karsh, of course, uh, look at his stuff. It's just phenomenal. Karsh.org is his um, his website. And uh, George Harrell is georgeharrell.com. So I encourage you to uh, check those out and uh, see what you think. Okay, let's see who's next on the list. The next guy is, oh, Jim Marshall. So Jim Marshall is a little, he's a different animal here in this whole list, but he's somebody that had a big influence on me. And he was, if you don't know who Jim Marshall is, he really was Mr. Rock and Roll. He photographed everybody and anybody in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, he was really, and, ha and the thing is he had access to these people that nobody else did. And I'll show you some of the photos and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but his work was just phenomenal. And it I did a lot of concert photography in my career, earlier in my career. And, um, and maybe because of him, I don't know, but, um, it was just, it's just, he's, his work is just phenomenal. I'll show you. So, so. Like, um, so here's one with Bob Dylan, and uh, the the story was that he and Bob Dylan and uh, a young lady or two were going for breakfast, and he, this Bob Dylan was kicking his, playing with his tire, and he, and Jim Marshall took one or two frames, and that was it, and he said that the thing he loved about it was it just showed that Bob Dylan was just a kid at heart at the time, you know? So he had probably had all this fame already, but still, um, to him, he was just a kid, just playing with a tire. Um, this is um, Jim Marshall and Janis Joplin. And it looks like a bottle of whiskey or something there, which, of course, if you know anything about her, that probably makes sense. Jimi Hendrix, of course, my, one of my uh, my heroes as a growing up, just an amazing uh, guitarist. And he, um, this is... Um, Obviously, um, the Stones, Mick Jagger on their plane, you know. But again, the access he had was unbelievable. And um, this is um, um, Peter Frampton, if you know who he is. But um, one of the things that, that was his claim to fame, Jim Marshall putting on the map, was Woodstock. Photos he did of Woodstock. And uh, that really la helped launch his career as well. But he'd been photographing these groups, got to know them very well before that. Okay. Um, make sure I have any other questions, you guys. Got a few more here. So that was, uh, so Jim Marshall. So this next one probably shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. A modern photographer, current photographer. But the thing I love about her work is um how she's transitioned so she too started as a uh, oh by the way real quick i want to back up one second the thing with uh, jim marshall i was telling you about that i thought was pretty interesting um you also might want to look up somebody named linda eastman linda eastman i don't think she was related to eastman kodak i was going to look that up i don't think so but um linda eastman um you may was no was married to somebody you might know, and his name was Paul McCartney, and Lin Lindy Eastman also did a lot of photo um, rock and roll photography back in the day, and she had access to these groups at all. I have one of her books that's that's very similar. So if you want to look up some of that kind of work that's very similar to Jim Marshall, um, look up Linda Eastman. 
Um, I don't know if it's Linda Eastman McCartney or Linda McCartney. I think it's just Linda McCartney now. But anyway, um, before she passed away. So look up Linda Eastman if you want to look up some of her um, concert work as well. Um, rock and roll stuff, um, photography as well. Okay. So the other one, of course, is, is Annie Leibovitz. Now, Annie Leibovitz is somebody that also started off working for um, um, Rolling Stone magazine and some things like that. And eventually became a portrait photographer and, um, a, you know, pretty fine one. But one of the quotes that she, I found of hers, she had a lot of them, but there was a number I really liked. And it said, when I take a picture, I take 10% of what I see. And what she's trying to say here is something that I've often experienced as well. And that is that when I judge an image of success, I judge how close is what I see in my head to what comes up on the screen or the paper. And rarely does it happen. Rarely. I mean, 10% is probably pretty good. So if you you want to, that's why I said you want to kind of pre-visualize what you think the image is going to look like and then shoot to that, try and achieve that. you never be able to do it. Although I will tell you that once in a while there's a happy accident and you actually get something better than what you thought of and you, you came up with in your head. It's not very often, but once in a while. And that's all about being open to the to what's going on, open to um, the surroundings, being in the moment, and not letting the technology get in the way. Because I've had that happen before. I'm messing with my camera, and there's something happening in front of the camera, I'm not even paying attention, and I miss it. So you don't want that to happen. So you want, so you want to pre-visualize an idea, a concept, then try and shoot to that. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I was doing a um, a magazine cover for a, a company or a magazine, and they were there was these four women that were um, well off, and they were raising money and donating money for this charity. And um, so I was photographing them against the white Siemens for a children's charity. So I had this idea, and I went in with this idea ahead of time, and I got all the supplies, but I didn't know if they were going to do it or not. So I had them, I, I took the photo, and I had them, you know, against the white seamless and different poses, things like that. And we were done there. So, okay, great, this is it. Anything else? I said, yeah. I said, one more thing. Would you mind one more picture? I said, sure, what do you need? And I opened up, and I had these paper plates laid out on a table with finger paint in them, red, green, yellow, blue. And I said, would you guys mind sticking your hands in this paint and holding it up to the camera? And I also had them put their handprints on the background, so painted on the hand. And they were like, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, they had, they said, what about, I got jewelry on. They had all their jewelry, diamonds and stuff. You know, I mean, again, they were fundraising. And um, I said, well, what about one hand? And they said, okay, we can do that. And so they did that. I did the shot, and the magazine loved it. And that's what went on the cover. So it could have worked. It might not have worked. They might have said no. But the point is, that's telling a story. That is where you go in ahead of time. You have this idea. It may work. You're going to try it and see if it's going to work. You have to be ready to abandon it if it doesn't work because you may not have a lot of time. But at least going with at least one or two ideas ahead of time to see if maybe you can make the story even stronger. And when I do this, I find 75 to 80 percent of the time they will use my idea, my images over their own because they don't really know what's available, what's what can be done. And again, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to put a backstory behind what the image is by looking at what they're trying to sell or set or talk about or what the story is about the articles about. So that's the way you should look at all your photos, even if it's just a family portrait. What's the story? Who are these people? What can I put in this image that's in the background is going to tell something about these people? Then people look at them and say, oh, that's Bob and Sue for sure. Man, look at that. And they'll recognize that. Anyway, again, I know I go on and off about this. You guys are probably tired of hearing me say this, but it's very, very important because that's what people will hire you for. That's what will make a great image, not just a mediocre image. All right. All right, so Annie Leibovitz, let's look at some of her work. 
Um, so this is um, this is a cool picture. I'm sure this is probably in New York of um, uh, Angelina Jolie. And you're going to see her stuff always has um, a story behind it. I'm going to show you some. This is some stuff that she did um, for, she's doing some stuff for Disney, been doing some stuff for Disney. It's just fantastic. It's behind the scenes. Let's see if this is the, uh, these are in sequence. Yeah, they are. I think so. So here's what it looks like. This is what, what, the, what the behind the scenes look like. Okay. And this is what the final look like. All right. Another one. This is um, another image for Disney. Okay. Whoops. This is this is what it looked like when you were done. This is John, a portrait of Johnny Depp. Again, even though there's not, you know, there's not a lot of story there. there to me, there's story everywhere. I mean, in his dress, his way he's looking. The 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 uh, outfit he's on it definitely has story to it, and of course he's a character anyway. So if you know that about him, uh, Meryl Streep, of course, woman of many faces. I think that's what she was trying to say here. That's the way I interpreted it. So um, even in a simple portrait, you can tell a story. It doesn't just have to be somebody looking there staring at the camera. Um, now getting your your client to agree to do this that's another story. So anyway, that's the hard part usually is convince them. Say, hey, I got this idea. And they're like, what? Uh, in fact, one of the quotes I think she, that um, Annie Leibovitz said, let's see if I see it here. Um, uh, well, it's not, but I'll read this one. It says, so everyone has a point of view. Some people call it style. But what we're really talking about is the guts of a photograph. When you trust your point of view, that's when you start taking pictures. Again, so what I'm trying to tell you, story, right? Gut, unique, your intuition. Um, she also says, one doesn't stop seeing, one doesn't stop framing. It doesn't turn off and turn on. It's on all the time. And that is definitely something that I teach in my course on seeing. I'm seeing photos everywhere I go, even if I have a camera or not. I'm always taking photos. I'm looking, I'm watching, I'm learning, I'm observing I'm becoming an observant of light, surroundings, structure, texture, all those things. That's what you have to do, and you want to always be doing that, looking at that, saying, well, I could use that. Oh, there's some over there. I bet if, that's a cool idea. I, if I combine it with this over here, I bet that would make an interesting photo. So that's part of the storytelling, part of the active scene that you want to become accustomed to and learn to be able to do. Okay, a couple more, and we're done here. So the next one is um, a guy named Tim Tatter. This is a, Tim's a, a commercial photographer. Now his work is again very very different from all the other stuff I've been showing you. Um, but he says I like to portray portray subjects in a way which they feel to represents their power and strength. Whether it's an 89 year old marathon runner or a 22 year old NFL MVP. Now, he does a lot of sports figures, and I've done a lot of sports figures, so I feel the same way. Even if I'm not doing a sports figure, if I'm photographing somebody, I want them to, you know, they're a strong enough character, I want that character to come through. If you've looked at any of my photos of my boxing or my roller derby girls, I want those people to be strong, vibrant people, and that's, so I have that same philosophy. So um, this is one of his photos. Very, it's very high, highly produced, but his lighting is phenomenal. So it's a very, very different kind of work than you than than um, the other stuff we're talking about that we've seen so far. Doesn't mean this is the kind of stuff that you would shoot, but I'm I'm trying to inspire you. I'm trying to give you some ideas of what's out there. The more you know, the more you see, the more it gives you ideas of how you can use either a piece of this or a technique of this in your own work. He works with another guy named um, I forgot the guy's name, Mike somebody, who does a lot of uh, CGI work, and the two of them. Um, put a lot of cool things together, which compositing, which I think is phenomenal. Um, this is a series he did called Astronauts. There's a video on his website of this. I don't know how he does it. But this, the the um, helmet fills up with smoke. It's just phenomenal. Again, very, very cool stuff. Um, you know, again, very, very highly produced, of course, but still very, very impressive. 
One of the things I really like, though, is he also injects um, some humor in there once in a while, too. So, okay. So, Tim Tatter, that's the other guy that you might want to look at. All right. And then the last one. Oh, by the way, sorry. Keep forgetting here. Let's see. Tim's is timtatter.com. That's a tough one, right? Look at his work if you want to look at some more of his stuff. All right. So the next one is Dan Winters. Now, Dan's work is a very, he's out of Texas, very different um, photographer, very kind of organic. Um, I don't, when you see his work, some people may say, oh, it's just stylized, but it's not. It's, there's something about it. I don't know why I'm attracted to it, quite honestly, but it's very, very different. He says, one's visual language is not something that manifests overnight. It develops organically over a lifetime. Shifts can be subtle and be virtually imperceptible and, um, and, and at times become so for, come to fruition so rapidly and such force that the profundity, profundity of it is all-consuming. That is life's work. Now, what he's trying to say here, and it's something that I've experienced myself, um, People will look at a photo. They'll do it to me all the time. So they'll bring, hey, hey, Lee, this looks like well, this is, looks like your one of your photos. I'm like, really? They'll see something that they see in my style that I don't even see. It take took a while to even for me to recognize my style and what I was doing and the kind of stuff that I like to shoot. Um, and it just takes time. Like he's trying, like Dan's trying to say, you just have to do it over and over and over again. And you may not even see it. Somebody else will see it before you do. And that's because we're too close to it. So just go back and look at the kind of stuff you like to shoot. So, you know, like here's an example. In Lightroom, you can go through, I don't know if you know, and pick um, the kind of all your images that were shot with certain, by, by lens, by camera, et cetera. And you can go in and it'll show you how many images you shot with a 24 millimeter versus a 105, for example. And you can say, wow, I, I like wide, it seems like I shoot a lot of wide angle. And you'll find, and you start looking at it and say, well, you know, I didn't realize that I do that. So it's, again, you do it automatically into an intuition. You don't realize it, but it's there. And that is what you need to try to do to define your style and look and understand what your style is. Style is not presets. I know a lot of people think that. They're, they're all like this, all like that. And they'll throw a preset on an image, and that's, a, that's not a style. That's a technique, that's a trick, that's a gimmick. The style is something very, very different. So look at Dan's work here. Um, so here's one. This is, I love this, the humor, you know, Will Ferrell, of course, crazy man. Um, this one, this is, you know, I, so again, the juxtaposition and the humor is something that I put in my own work when possible. And, uh, but then his, he also has a style where he likes to only light part of the face. Okay, Al Pacino, same kind of style. Wow, interesting. Just a great photo. Okay. Again, simple, not complicated, probably one or two lights, but the expression, the mood, everything works, in my opinion. This is Wynton Marcellus. Wynton Marcella. Who's a um, uh, jazz musician? Okay. So again, Dan Winter. His um, his um, URL is whoops, sorry, I keep going wrong. Dan Winters Photo dot com. It's not under Dan Winters. It's Dan Winters Photo dot com. So uh, check Dan's work out too, and see what you think of that. I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and I'd love to hear what you guys think. You know, leave some, in the comments some photographers that you like, that you follow, that you think are inspiring for the kind of work that you do. Um, it's not, it, there, it's okay to look at other people's work. I don't, you don't want to compare yourself because while your, your work is unique, you want to look at your own work. And that, you, it's kind of like golf. If you've ever played golf, you don't really play against somebody else, you're against playing against your own score. And that's the way, really, the way photography is. And um, so you want to kind of do the same thing here. But um, 
it's it's a lot like I think I describe it as like playing a musical instrument. If you're learning a, a musical instrument, then you know you may learn the chords, which is ISO, shutter speed, things like that. Um, and then you will um, eventually you'll buy a songbook, right? And you'll start playing other people's songs. You'll learn in those songs and their riffs and that type of thing. And that's okay to look at some of this kind of other people's work and say, wow, I wonder how they did that. Break that down. That's pretty interesting how they did that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a book out called Steal Like an Artist. And it's about basically saying there's nothing that's new under the sun and that everything's been done, and which these variations of everything that's already been done is all we're really doing. But so there's nothing wrong with taking some of these techniques and incorporating them into your own work. Um, in your own style because you put your own twist on it just like again you'll start doing the songbook and then you'll start ad-libbing and doing your own kind of music with it so anyway um, I hope this has been helpful again if you um, love to have you um, come back again every Friday we do this again if you I'll remind you one more time that we're doing photo reviews next Friday so if you want your work to be looked at we'll I'd love to have you here um, just um, Submit some work, and what we'll do is we'll look at it versus these are the, the kind of the criteria that I look at. I look at the seven common shapes in art and how the work compares and how it communicates these messages. It's not, it's oh, I should also mention it's all anonymous. So no watermarked work, and your name will not be used because we don't want to embarrass anybody. I want you to submit work so you can prove. Not about likes or getting notoriety, it's about helping you work seeing your work improve and getting to be better and more confident so again so hopefully you will um join us next week and uh, love to have you so again next week uh we're on the same time friday night set 9 p.m and uh hope you're there everybody have a good night